Turan, pronounced in an Australian accent. Uh, Nick Turan is a PhD nuclear engineer who joined the field specifically to help fight climate change. He has expertise in advanced nuclear reaction design, development, and history. After training at the University of Michigan, he spent over a decade at Terra Power in Seattle, working on neutronics analysis, business development, software development, and configuration management. He's been active in public education around nuclear since 2006, as the founder and sysadmin of whatisnuclear.com. He's been featured on NPR's Science Friday and on the National Academy of Science's Distinctive Voices series. For tonight's talk, uh, this will be a whirlwind tour of nuclear power's past, present, and future, covering interesting details in forgotten nuclear reactor history and the cutting edge of next generation reactors and fuel cycles. He will discuss the major challenges and solutions of, to decarbonizing electricity, heat, and industry with nuclear power at world scale. Please put your hands up for Nick Turan. Be here. I, I came, I gave a talk to this group maybe in 2018. Um, I checked those slides to make sure that they aren't the same slides. There's a few that may look familiar just to jog your memory, but there's a, there's a slight difference in every one. So, but I think there's only five repeats. But uh, so how many of you were at the last one? Do you remember? Yeah, I, I thought I remembered it. Anyway, so and this is an experimental slide deck. Um, it's a little bit of a, it's a two-dimensional slide deck. I just made it the other day. Um, so there's different sections, and then you can go down as deep as you want. And we have to tune that to like, how much detail you want to go into. <laughs> and uh, we, we don't have time to go through every single one. But anyway, so we'll just kind of go through it. And I think if you do have, like, pressing quick questions in the middle of it, I mean, I'm happy to have a... Uh, you can interrupt, that's fine, it's a small group. And I'll try to leave questions for like discussion at the end, because a lot of times on these, topic, on these topics, people have quite a bit that they want to hear more about. So I'm interested in what you guys want to hear more about. So without further ado, we'll get started. Um, just to provide context, uh, I like to get started with just like, what's the current status and context of energy in the world? Just to sort of lay out like why exactly we're doing this. My favorite definition of energy, you may all know that it's the ability to do work, but um, my better definition of energy is that it's a substitute for the labor and time of human beings and animals. Um, so there's a bunch of low energy lifestyles up above, in a low energy world, if you're doing construction, you're using animal and human labor, it's not very pleasant. Um, in a high energy world, there's one person in an electric power crane doing the work of thousands of people with a joystick, uh, thanks to energy. In low energy farming, 95% of people spend all of their time farming. You have no time to do anything else. If there's a weather event, you starve, it's not great. High energy, one robot driving a combine feeds thousands upon thousands of people. And how many of you grow all of your food? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so again, it's energy gives you, you can farm if you want, but you don't have to. Energy gives you that choice. And it, so anyway, washing, um, travel, same deal. So that's the basic reason energy is important. And if you try to quantify it, you can, you can try to quantify human happiness. That's not easy to quantify. But there is a thing that the UN uses called the Human Development Index, which is like a composite of education and health and economics. I um, mean, if you graph that as a function of electricity use per capita, you see the super interesting graph where you have two major asymptotes, where like, here we are in the United States, if we had a little bit less energy, and this, this doesn't imply causation, but there is a strong correlation. But So if we use half as much energy, it's likely that our HDI would kind of like be the same. We can we waste a lot of energy. We could do better with the efficiency. But there's places, and these bubbles are proportional to population. If you go, if people on this asymptote want a little bit more quality of life, they're going to use a huge amount more energy. And it's just unbelievable. Like, you get one pump in a, in a village, and people don't have to go fetch water every day. That is truly transformational, and that requires energy. So you can see, as a world, we kind of want to move these people up into the green and probably <coughs> pull these people back into the, into the green. Yeah. Uh, why is Norway the outlier? Uh, they have a huge amount of super cheap uh, hydro, and they use it. They're, they they waste a lot of energy, and they have a lot of oil industry. Um, so they're just like massive energy consumers, and they have like ultra cheap, the world's cheapest, incredible hydro resources. 
like, you know, what is the, what's, what's the paradox or the more cheap energy you have, the more you use? Java. Yeah, yeah dark, yeah. Ja Java is the paradox. Yeah. Anyway, that's basically the answer. Okay. So, um, more quantitatively, I mean, here, this is going to be hard to read, but this is like the sources of energy in the United States. So we have oil, <coughs> biomass, coal, natural gas, geothermal, wind, hydro, nuclear, solar. And then the end uses, residential, commercial, industrial, transportation. You can see this is electricity. About 36% of our total energy goes to electricity. And, uh, and, so, and then the rest of it is like natural gas is doing industry and building heat. Oil, of course, is doing transportation. So a lot of times people just think about electricity, but there's like a huge world of energy beyond electricity that we have to keep in mind as well. So I don't want to go on with that. But I love those diagrams. Yeah, these are great. It's, great. it's better than a giant screen. Well, that rejected energy piece a lot of people would ignore, but that's yeah. actually pretty important. Yeah, and, and then we'll talk about that. You could use some of that rejected energy as well, but um, anyway, yeah, very interesting stuff. Okay, so fossil fuels, nobody the super not no one likes to like go around cheering on fossil fuels, but it's worth it's worth acknowledging that fossil fuels truly did power the industrial revolution and they gave us things that we all enjoy. Um, you name it. I mean fertilizer, uh, <coughs> end of world hunger or reduction of world hunger, moon landing, uh, Chihuly, it's all fossil fuel power. <laughs> um, and, I mean, like coal, uh, there was a time when Europe was tearing down every tree they could find to make charcoal because you'd have to burn a lot of wood without oxygen to make charcoal. And then when they found coal, coal actually saved the forests of Europe. So, like, there's some, there's a lot of, like, good that has come out of fossil fuels, and that's, like, really unpopular to say in Seattle, but that's just kind of how it is. But, of course, there are two major problems with fossil fuels. One is air pollution. Seven million people die prematurely from air pollution, according to the World Health Organization. So air pollution, particulates, that's biofuel and fossil, very bad. This is indoor stoves. This is outdoor. Um, this is indoor biofuel stoves, like when you don't have, uh, you don't have like an oven. <laughs> and then this is like from regular power plants. Okay, and then the other big one, of course, is climate change. And I'm sure you guys have talked about this plenty. There's a pretty significant uh, human influence on climate change due to mostly fossil fuel emissions that have increased CO2 levels, causing global warming. And so we have to say, thank you, fossil fuels. You've done your part. Now get the hell out of here. And we have to get off of you, even though you still make 80% of the total energy of the world. So it's like a massive challenge. So we have to increase the amount of energy to get everyone out of poverty. And we also have to totally phase out fossil fuel and biofuel for their particulate and air pollution. Or, and, climate change reasons. Fortunately, we have solutions. Um, this is a graph showing the life cycle carbon <coughs> emissions per kilowatt hour of different sources. And I'm sorry, it's small again, but we have the fossil and biofuel down here. And these are cradle to grave life cycles. So like whole system analysis, not just one part of the other. And then you have your solar, which is you know way less than any of these guys. Your geothermal, hydro, wind, and here's nuclear down at 12, and here's wind on shore at 11. So, and that's where nuclear enters the game. So nuclear is among the lowest carbon forms of energy that we have. Does that take into account uh, every stuff like uh, mining? Yeah, mining, uh, it's literally like exploring for mining, then mining, enrichment, wow. construction, operation, fueling, uh, decommissioning, and long-term waste disposal. And wow. similar for all the other sources. That's why it's non-zero. Yeah, exactly. Oh, right. It'd be zero right. if it was, that's right. Yeah. Should, yeah. Okay, so that's... So enter nuclear. So what is nuclear energy? And I think most of you probably kind of know this, so I'll go fast through it. So you've all seen this. This is the periodic table of the elements. Every different element is a different number of protons. Uh, that's great. Did you know that each one of these, I mean, some of these, the atomic weight of like iron is 55.8. Why is it 55.8? Well, it's an average of all the different isotopes of iron. There's a bunch of different irons. They all have the same number of protons, but they have different numbers of neutrons. And those are called the isotopes. And there's actually a different chart called the oops, yeah, called the chart of the nuclides. And this is interesting in that it sort of starts. So here's hydrogen, and there's regular hydrogen, and then there's deuterium, tritium, and then four, you know, a, a proton with three neutrons, five, two, four neutrons, and so on. And so there's a bunch of different isotopes of hydrogen. There's a bunch of different isotopes of helium. There's a bunch of different lithiums. 
beryllium's, borons, and it goes on and on and on. And this turn is gigantic. Here's a, whoops, I'll stop doing this. Here's like a bigger exploded picture of it. So each y-axis is like a proton number, and there's like this many isotopes. There's thousands and thousands of isotopes, and they all different. They're all chemically identical, um, but they have very different nuclear properties. And um, so one interesting nuclear property is if you go to the isotopes of uranium, there's two of them in nature, and one of them is the very rare one, which is called U-235, it's 0.7%, and if you hit it with a neutron, this neutron can just come right into the nucleus, and it creates this very unstable compound nucleus that just splits in half, fissions, like, where's the shirt? It's like cellular fission. <laughs> Thank you, there's a better definition. Does this make me exhibit A? <laughs> yeah, and when, and when this was discovered, I mean, they named it after cellular fission, because they're like, it's just like uh, in biology. And so the atom actually splits. These guys come uh, This is real early. It's actually, it was underwater. This is a big annular water. Is it bikini? Uh, it's not, a, it's in, um, yeah, it's on the Pacific Islands. I'm not sure if it's a bikini. Hole. Yeah, bikini was Castle Bravo. Yeah, I think it was. Anyway, it's near. It's near there. Was that a boat going up? There yeah, they put a bunch of. Yeah, this, uh, is, they, they, this is a ghost fleet. They put all these ships out here, and they put. That's a ninety degree tilt. Yeah. It, it's, anyway, so we all know. We all kind of. Know. <laughs> Did you say? Ghost fleet? Yeah, ghost fleet. It's a bunch of old, decrepit ships. This is after World War II. This is like 1946. They took all their old ships, and they just put them out there, and they started shooting off nuclear weapons to see how their ships would handle nuclear weapons. Oh, uh, badly. Yeah, and this is a tiny little, this is a, this is a first generation tiny little nuclear weapon. Uh, the ones that they were launching in the 50s were like a thousand, two thousand times more powerful than that. So they went, there's no point putting ships there for those ones. So anyway, this is terrifying, and this is what like really kicked off, you know, the concept. This is nuclear physics in the in the public's mind, right? So, but even then, I mean, after the the scientists who developed all this, after the world the war ended, they were like, finally, we can start considering what we can do with this incredible new science that we've discovered, or good. Like, what can we do for the good of humanity instead of doing something destructive? Okay, worth mentioning, there's also a fusion nuclear reaction. I think you all know this as well, but rather than splitting big atoms, you can also push two uh, highly charged nuclei together if they're really small and they'll fuse, and that also releases a huge amount of energy. Go figure, physics. Um, I remember my talk last month about that. Oh, great. <laughs> so, uh, I'll just skip it. But yeah, so this is, we have, we have weaponized this very successfully, and that's where those huge thermonuclear bombs come from. But we have never been able to turn this into a commercial power source, unlike fission, which, we, which powers 10% of the planet. Okay, so, and then just to summarize, fission, fusion, uh, in nature, there were fission, there was a natural fission reaction two billion years ago in Africa. This is a crazy story in itself, but um, it was discovered in the 70s. That, like there were just some weird water deposits and they concentrated some bacteria concentrated uranium and they went critical and we can still see the fission products today so there were actual nuclear fission georeactors on earth which is crazy self-moderating yeah exactly for a they long went, period of time would boil and then it would come, yeah um fusion of course happens in the sun it's it's very it's we're familiar with that in the natural world discovery first chain reaction uh, was in 1942 at cp1 in chicago first you could kind of call it a chain reaction but the first like big release of energy from fusion was a thermonuclear weapon <laughs> 51 weaponized made electricity 1951 in, in idaho was the first actual electricity made from a nuclear I visited that. It's so very small. It's one of my favorite museums. Yeah, yeah if you're ever driving through the yeah. Snake River Valley, definitely in the summer. It's only open for like yeah. a very uh, small amount of time. There was a terrible accident in that Idaho. One of their reactors. No, there, no, no, there were a bunch of yeah. there were a bunch of meltdowns in a bunch of reactors. That one. Distinctly remember somebody in the Oh, oh, oh that one. Rod. That was a dip. That one was the SL one. SL one. That's the name. That's later. That was in the 60s. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, and I mean, yeah. So we'll talk about this, but I mean, let's talk about boiler accidents that made the ASN boiler code. There's a bunch of gruesome stuff in every technological advance. Um, okay, propulsion. So we've never made electricity uh, from fusion. 
propulsion we did in 1955 on the Nautilus. Uh, we powered an ice base under the ice in Greenland with a nuclear reactor in 1960. We put a nuclear fusion reactor in outer space in 1965. And we had competitive commercial power in 1965 at Oyster Creek. Uh, yeah. And so now it makes 10%, fission makes 10% of electricity, and there's a bunch of startup companies raising untold billions of dollars working on doing This is just for the US? 10% uh, of world electricity. Oh, these these mm -hmm. milestones are very US. In fact, those are all US centric, except for that one. Mm -hmm. um, and that one, it was discovered in Germany. Um, but yeah, there's similar milestones in other countries that are like just a few years after this, those same milestones were hit by like the Soviet Union and others. Could I ask a question? <laughs> sure. Okay, so you said that we haven't made electricity using fusion, but you also say that in nature the sun is a fusion reactor. Yeah, sorry. Ma so like, isn't solar energy technically using fusion? Yeah, oh yeah. I mean, yeah, everything, <laughs> solar, wind, hydro is all nuclear fusion technically, but I guess I should say uh, made electricity like on Earth, like terrestrial nuclear reactors. Direct, well, yeah. direct shot. Yeah. <laughs> if we're going to get that far, then coal is technically fusion. Exactly. What exactly. made the coal living thing? How do they live? The sun. That's right. We have, I have a great, I have a great like, flow chart that shows all those things. Anyway. Okay. So let's, let's go in a little bit more. So how does, um, how does a nuclear plant work? And this is just going to be slide version, so bear with me. So first, the energy was all put in there by a big <laughs> uh, colliding neutron merger, an emerging neutron star or a, a large supernova, and that's what packed in. You know, all these neutrons piled up, and it like um, stored energy in these big uranium atoms. Um, those uranium atoms then cooled off and have been sitting around. They've been sitting around in rocks ever since. And you can go out in the yard and you can find a rock that has uranium in it that still has that energy in it from those from that emerging neutron star. And in fact, um, and it's slowly bubbling out some of its energy. Some, like uranium has a super long half-life and it lets out some of its energy all the time. And so if you happen to have some uranium minerals like this that you just found somewhere, and if you happen to have a Geiger counter like this, you can um, hold the uranium mineral up to the Geiger counter, and it should start clicking. Well, this is background. It should click once every two seconds or so. And then when you put this up to it, you can kind of hear there's a lot more clicks. So each click is one atom shooting out an alpha particle very slowly. And it's been clicking like this literally since this event. Like this happened, and then this started clicking like that, and it's been clicking like that ever since then for billions and billions of years. So it's very interesting. And this rock is not hot. I mean, I can hold it in my hand. I can't boil water with this. I can't make electricity with this. So like, even though it's letting some of its energy out, it's not coming out fast enough. So I need to do something to get that energy to come out fast enough. And to do that, I need to make a machine that sustains a chain reaction. And that is what a nuclear reactor does. Yeah, you know, I, I just have have to say that. Do you know how many people who are not skeptics would have been just frightened of that right now? I mean, the, the perception of the public of radioactivity is it, really. If you take, I've taken, I have, a, I have a video of myself taking this exact agricutter on an airplane, and uh, yeah. um, if you turn this on on an airplane, it clicks just like that. Yeah. Because yeah. outer space is radioactive. But people don't know this. Yeah, people don't know this. I, yeah, when I turned it on, I made, I made sure to turn the audio off. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Where'd you um, find that rock, by the way? Uh, actually, I got that one on eBay. Oh. <laughs> there's, a bunch, there's a bunch you can find out in Spokane. Uh, and I've looked around here to try to find some myself, but so far I've found Spokane has tons of them. I've got to go get them. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it does, it is, I wish more people had Geiger counters. You could set it on your granite and you would see it clicking. And you could take it on a plane and see it clicking and so on. And just get used to the fact that there are natural sources of low dose radiation. It's just part of life. It's been part of life forever. That's something that it would be very helpful if people knew. You've read the, the recent stuff about the tritium leak in Minnesota. Well, the dose rates are like way lower than the background, uh, but like people just don't get it. It's either radioactive or it's not. But the fact is, everything's great. But anyway, we'll get into the marketing talk about it later. So, 
All right, so you have the rocks, you need to get them to split faster to get the energy out. So you crush them up, you turn them into something called yellow cake. This is a purified form of uranium. Uh, and then you got to enrich it. And so I mentioned there's two isotopes of uranium. There's this little uh, guy. Wait a minute, wait, can you go back one? Because we had this whole thing about the uh, uh, American uh, involved in the political campaigns who was looking for yellow cake in Nigeria or yeah. something like that. So then so now, I guess the question I'm trying to pose is, is this a very easy thing to produce once you've got what you consider a uranium mine? Yeah. It's a step from the uranium mine yeah, this to yellow is easy. This trivial. is trivial. Like you can, some high school chemistry student can you crush up the rock and bubble some gas through it and you get a yellow cake. It's real easy. It's very well known. Not a secret about it. You can get some uranium from the cocaine, crush it up, you got yellow cake. It's like not a big deal. I think at that time they were talking about several big tons of it. Um, I mean, people try to keep an eye on where the yellow cake is. Significant so quantities. Yeah, significant <laughs> quantities. So one, yeah. Anyway, but yeah, it's it's not that big of a deal. I don't know if we if going to a war because of that was. It's simple in terms of pulling it out of the earth and getting it to this yeah, stage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Trivial technology. Trivial. Okay. <coughs> The enrichment is less trivial, but still doable. We're hearing about that. Yeah. So, okay, when you dig it out, this is your isotopic concentration. You have 0.7% of the uranium-235 isotope that splits readily, and the rest is this one that doesn't split readily, but more on that later. And then there's also a nuclear fuel called thorium, none of which splits readily, but you can, if you invest a single neutron into it, you can convert it to a nuclear fuel. Same with uranium-238. So those, if you invest the neutron in, if you happen to have extra neutrons, you can turn these into nuclear fuel. But to get started, you have, you just have this stuff to get started with. And so all, almost all the reactors on the planet Earth run just on that stuff, and they, and they run on it by enriching it, which just means increasing the concentration of this to and to enrich it, they're chemically identical, so you can't do any chemistry on them. So the only way to enrich them is mechanically. And so you literally just spin them. So you turn it into a gas, uh, and you stick it in the centrifuge, and you spin it really fast. And the centrifugal, centripetal forces separate the heavier one out more than the lighter one. And if you run it through a cascade, uh, you can get, you can enrich the lighter one relative to the heavier one. And so these are these gas centrifuges spin at many tens of thousands of RPMs and are pretty sophisticated. And so these are these are much more of a like protected technology. Um, although at this point, it's, there's a guy named Aq Khan who took a design of this and sold it on the black market back in the when was it, the 70s. Anyway, so this these things are pretty out. Everyone has these as well, um, but they're more of a protected thing. Like there's inspections and safeguards. And a lot of the news with Iran has to do with centrifuges. So, so that's, a, that's a vertical thing, and each one of these is spinning? Yeah, they all spin. And how do they move as a cascade? How well, like, so this one's just piped in, like, the outer side, the inner part of this one goes into the feet of this one, and oh, the okay. outer part of that one goes into the feet okay. of that one, and then so on and so on. And they're all spinning, and so as it goes down the line, it just gets more and more and more enriched gradually, just by continuing this mechanical separation process. And so you can enrich up to like 1% or 2% uranium 235 or 5%, which is what a typical reactor does. It just, the, the, the weapons part of it is if you run that same exact technology for longer, then you can go beyond 5% and up into like, once you get to 95%, then you're in weapons territory. So the big political concern is like, well, if you have these, sure, you might be making reactor fuel, but also you might be making weapons if you're running them in a basement somewhere. So that's sort of a... It's a centrifuge, and that's generally required for like a lot of chemistry. Right? Yeah, but they're they're fancy gas centrifuges. They're a lot different than a, a normal chemical centrifuge. There's they're real carbon fiber crazy bearings. It's real fancy. But yeah, I mean they're not that. Lots of people have them. So so wasn't it some aluminum tubes that uh, that <clears throat> Cheney thought that the uh, the Iraqis had or were trying to buy? In order to make <coughs> no, <clears throat> I actually yeah I or think they were total, looking at or was that total BS that Cheney was talking? I actually about? I don't know the details of that particular story, but I'm sure it's about the tubes that make it would probably be like some carbon fiber tubes. No, they, they were special kinds of aluminum. Special aluminum, okay. And so that's, that's why I'm raising it because no, I, don't, I don't see us talking about aluminum here. I'm sure it was about this technology, but I don't know the details of that story. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
anyway, okay. So, um, so you enrich it, and then you fabricate it into these little tiny pellets. So this is now like 5% enriched uranium, and you put it in these little pellets, and it's still just as radioactive as this thing I'm holding my hand. So you can hold it with a glove. It's not. It's lightly radioactive because it's, uh, it, the atoms haven't split yet. Um, and then you load those guys up into these tubes, and these are the cladding tubes of the fuel assembly, so you stack all those little pellets into the into these arrays, and that's just getting them close enough together but still leaving room around them so that you can pass a coolant by them, because it's going to make a lot of heat, and so you have to pump a coolant, and so you need space to pump a coolant. Uh, and then you load those all up into a core, so there's a bunch of these fuel assemblies. Here's a person for scale. This is a nuclear core, um, and you, you put a couple hundred of those assemblies together, and now they're in the right geometry that they can sustain a, chain, a, nuclear chain, a controlled nuclear chain reaction. And that's when you can start getting billions of watts of heat out um, in steady state for two years in a row without stopping and turn it all into electricity and district heat and all sorts of other interesting and useful things. So that's that's where the magic happens, as they would say. Um, you've already seen the chain reaction picture. This is it again. You know, one atom splits, you put the other uranium atom there, it splits, and so on. And you do it in a way so that the neutrons that get lost balance out perfectly the neutrons that get uh, that cause a, the chain reaction. And so that's kind of what the nuclear engineer's job is to like keep that balance just right and keep the feedback so that if anything starts going the wrong way, it comes back instead of goes instead of diverging. And so that's like the, the trick of neutronics, as we call it, in reactor engineering. So um, and it turns out pretty, it's relatively easy to keep this super stable. So it goes to a certain power, and if anything happens, like if you start pumping in, if the water starts heating up, the power goes down until the water cools down. And so it's very self-correcting. Um, and then you have to, then you just pump heat around and uh, make electricity. Let's see if this plays. The process of creating electricity using nuclear power begins with a splitting so of uranium this atoms is the core in the reactor. That I was just the process doing. called fission produces heat. In a pressurized water reactor, the heat from the water surrounding the nuclear fuel is kept under pressure to prevent it from boiling. Yeah, so this is a big reactor the vessel. Water is piped from the reactor vessel to this a, is a steam pump, generator. And you just start pumping the coolant around. It transfers heat to boil water and makes steam in a second system. It's After a real fancy way of boiling energy, water. The water is pumped <laughs> back to the reactor vessel to be reused. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, yeah. so now you just have the steam, steam generator, and the steam just blows over the drive the generator to produce electricity. So here we have the steam blowing the over steam like the pin we build. The magnets move the electrons around. Where it is cooled and condensed back into water <laughs> and pumped back to the steam generator to be heated and reused. Yeah. Looks like a whiskey still from the backwoods of Mississippi. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's, 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 intent, it's supposed to be simple. I mean, there's a lot more systems in here. There's safety systems and so on. But like, that's the idea. You, you get the, now that you have this rock, it's really hot because you've started splitting the atoms, you know, yourself. Then you can boil enough water. And once you get this thing spinning like crazy, those big magnets can push electrons around like crazy. And that's where the electricity comes from. So um, that's it. That's how a nuclear reactor works. Um, yeah. So then after the fuel, so after uh, five years in the reactor, the fuel has split a lot of its atoms, not a high percentage of the atoms, but so many of the atoms that it can't sustain a chain reaction on its own anymore. So you pull the assemblies out and you stick them in this thing called a spent fuel pool. So this is where the spent rods go and they chill in this under in the swimming pool for five years or so. Um, they have to cool when you shut uh, when you shut a nuclear fuel assembly off. The chain reaction stops immediately, but it still emits quite a bit of heat. Um, Seven percent full power right at first, and then after a day, it's like one percent, and after a month, it's half a percent. But half a percent of a few mil million watts is still significant, so you do have to keep it cool. And that's just it. Sort of naturally, all those radioactive isotopes are slowly walking towards the stable isotope in the middle of that to charge the nuclei. Okay, and then after it cools long enough, um, it goes out into the parking lot into these spent ca into these dry casks, and so this is where this is the current U.S. brilliant plan of nuclear waste is to just throw them in the parking lot. And these are big steel and concrete, well shielded. You can stand next to them. There's pictures, lots of pictures of people hugging them and holding gagger cutters up to them. It doesn't register any more than 
why they're writing shows in this room. So, um, yeah, the, and it's, the interesting thing is like, there's a picture of uh, Jim Conka, who lives, who comes and gives talks sometimes, if you guys ever want to get him to give a talk all about nuclear waste, it's the best talk. But basically, like, if you power a city like Seattle for 15 years, all the waste would, would look pretty much like this. What you see right here is about all the waste you would generate from powering a mega city, or a big city, for 15 full years. So this, and that's because of that energy density. There's a tiny amount of nuclear waste per energy in a nuclear reactor. And then the, the final, the and final, it's, it's all solid, right? Yeah, it still looks like those little black ceramic pellets. That's what nuclear waste actually looks like. It's like a tea cup. Uh, unless you so, so is there any active cooling going on in those dry casts? No, these are air cooled. So there's little air vents, okay, so and this is totally natural. So pass, passive totally air passive. Yeah. Passive air cooling. Yep. And so, yeah, once they are low enough power to be able to survive in air cooling, they just move out to there. And they can be there for 100 years. About what is the temperature inside that thing when they first go into it? I think it's like 140 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. What if the daughter products from the uh, nuclear based pellets is a gas? Some of the some of those products are gases. So, so there's xenon. You've got, you've got a solid pellet that's got things that would be gases at room temperature. So I, I mean, I, I guess it just has to be strong enough to not break and. Uh, that's why pellets are based in material. That's why they have to break product. No, actually, radon, well, radon is a very minor product compared to the other. Like, uranium does decay through radon, so there is a little bit of radon in there. But the stuff that's fissions, there's a lot of krypton and xenon, uh, but a lot of that decays really quickly in days to stability. So those gases aren't as much of a concern. Do, do they come off of a, a dry gas? No, they, no, they're still in those, they're still in the cladding tubes, um, which are pressurized, and then they're also in a, another vessel inside of this thing. So those don't usually... Okay, really so the cooling air that's going through is not going through the same channels in the little tubes no. that you were using, putting the water through in the reactor. Right, there's, yes, there's like a vessel inside, and so it's cooling the outer wall oh, it's of it's cooling vessel. the outer wall yeah. of the vessel, so the vessel itself is sealed. Right. So is there a possibility of a buildup of um, pressurized, uh, say, hydrogen or something in, in, in that... In that in that cast? Um, hydrogen? I don't or, think I'm so. I'm just thinking, you know, is, yeah, there, no, is I mean, there something there, that can build up? There, I mean, yeah, the, beyond the fission gases, which are pretty low pressure overall, like there isn't there isn't a strong source of any gas in there that's going to pressurize that thing. I mean, the major, the major like, the rest of these are like lightning strike, missile, you know, airplane crash. Those are the, these are designed for those types of external hazards. And there's great videos of these getting run into by trains at full speed, fired by rockets, and dropped onto spikes, and burned in jet fuel for 90 minutes. They're very, they're unbelievably robust. <laughs> Did you see where this is? This one? Maybe uh, I missed it. This is a uh, Palo Verde, um, this one. But there's a, there's a picture just like this in at Columbia Generating Station down in the Tri-Cities. Yeah, Arizona. Right. Yeah, uh, yeah. Okay, so um, oops. so then once they come out of there, the, the plan, the long-term plan is to put them into another container that looks like this. This is still what the assemblies look like. Slide them into these casks, seal that up, and slide it into this big copper thing, and then put that into deep geologic repositories where it would last until it was completely decayed to nothingness. So, like right now, um, the number of people who have been injured by stored commercial nuclear waste, as far as I'm aware, is zero um, on those in those dry casks. And so we just want to be extra safe and get that like well out of the biosphere so you don't have to worry about things like terrorism or whatever, societal breakdown. So we just want to put this 500 meters underground in geologically stable areas where it's like there's no, you can't postulate any way that that's going to come out and get you. Especially when you consider that the alternative that we talked about earlier is fossil fuel, which kills 7 million people per year every year operating normally. So like, like comparing 7 million deaths per year compared to this, like, almost an absurd amount of safety around this material was, like, really an interesting dichotomy that we've chosen to do. This doesn't really make sense, in my opinion, because, like, why why are you okay with killing 7 million people per year through particulate air pollution, but, like, this, you, which has never in, injured anybody uh, in its stored form, you know, why is that, like, such a thing? And I think it's a psychological uh, We're not evolved to deal with radiation. Yeah. Black copper. 
Oh, it, um, corrosion resist, long-term corrosion resistance. Thank you. Yeah. Can you Could speak about the, sorry, can you speak up related to this about the vitrification problems that Hanford is having with Bechtel? I mean, it's oh, yeah. been going on for years. <laughs> yeah, um, so yeah, the Hanford, Hanford waste is weapons waste, and so it's similar nuclides, but from a totally different process where they, instead of just taking solid pins and sticking them in a reactor and pulling out solid pins, they took those solid pins and dropped them into vats of acid and they melted them all down into these huge vats of now radioactive acid and you know massive volumes. And the reason for that was because they were trying to pull out the plutonium, to concentrate it, and put it in bombs. Now they have liquid waste, it's, at, it's acidic, it's in tanks. The tanks were designed to last more than a couple of years. Now they're leaking, and so they're like, okay, we have to vitri we have to do something for it. And so they built this ridiculously expensive vitrification plant. Along the way, people came along and said, you know, if you just um, grout it in place, if you dump concrete into the tanks and, and, and treat it in a way that it's gonna be a stabilized form, that's like, 50 times cheaper, and it has just as effective at containing the radionuclides, but it became a political kerfuffle, and like no one, like the state didn't want to accept that, because then it would stay in Washington State, as opposed to when you vitrify it, turn it into a glass, it was going to ship off to some other state. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. North of Las Vegas. Okay, yeah. It wasn't going to Yucca Mountain or somewhere. Yeah, together. right. And, yeah. Yes. So anyway, there, it's, it's a huge mess, and there's been all this, I mean, it's like an endless money pit because, you know, we just didn't, in the Cold War, we didn't treat our nuclear weapons waste responsibly, and now we're just dealing with it. But even now, we're still being pretty irrational about it, because, like, just grounding it in place would be a much simpler solution. And the Congressional Budget Office has done a report that compares the two options, and is like, um, Hey, grounding it in place is like way easier. So, anyway, Jim Conco, again, you should have him. And he's been here a couple oh, times. Oh, yes, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's, he's the pro, I mean, he knows that stuff. Yeah, he didn't He didn't address that topic, though. Really? Waste. I learned that from you. <laughs> he, he's, he has like a two hour presentation yeah. that we have on our YouTube. Thing. He goes into it. Okay. So, sorry, I don't know if I'm going into Well, anyway, you guys are asking questions, so I guess we're good. <laughs> Um, okay, so status of nuclear power, I already mentioned it makes about 10% of the world's electricity. There's like 437 reactors. The blue ones are operating, the purple ones are offline but could be operating again. These are the ones in Japan, that will hopefully turn them off after Fukushima. And then the shutdown, retired ones are the red ones, so those are mostly old reactors that have just reached the end of their life. Um, and so here you see Columbia Generating Station, um, which makes cool. like which makes a few percent of our electricity. Black. What's what? What's the black? Uh, black. Under construction, great oh. question. Yeah. Yeah. So under construction, there's four, and in fact, three of those are online now, yeah. so my chart's out of date. Yeah. There's four big ones that are just getting built in the UAE. China is building a ton, Russia's building a ton. So that's where, like right now, the future of nuclear is happening in this part of the world, and they're building them quite effectively. Um, there's a few under construction that aren't going so well in, in Georgia. Uh, Although we just hit a big milestone for ours in Georgia. And then there's a few in Europe that are all kind of boondoggling. Uh, yeah, so here's kind of what capacity looked like over time. So um, started out, there were none, 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 none. And then we went totally exponential. It was the nuclear heyday. We were gonna decarbonize the whole planet and be totally energy independent. And then a bunch of things happened. Um, we had, there was, Actually, even in the mid, before, well before Three Mile Island, there were things like inflation that were coming along. There were major changes in safety regulations. Um, and then in, when Chernobyl happened, things really leveled out and the order books all sort of cleared out. And we coasted along for a long time. Japan and Germany shut down after Fukushima and like, so now Asia and UAE are just starting to ramp back up a little bit. So it's not, it's not the best story. I mean, we started out great, but then a bunch of kind of bad stuff happened and sort of at the moment, okay, yay, 10% of world electricity, like not that, it's not that, it's, it's a lot, but it's not, um, it's not where we want it to be, certainly. So that's, that's how that happened. A big chunk, oh yeah. Well, Nick, I've heard that the problem is right now in the United States and elsewhere is cost. Everyone, every reactor is different design has to be separately approved for South Korea and standardized. Why don't we do that? Yeah, that's that's a great question. That's like, that's my last, that's my economics slide, basically. It says, why don't we just do what South Korea does? We'll get there, but you're right. I mean, and that's, I mean, here's France. 
when France, um, this is France's non-fossil electricity, so fossils, you know, up, they're now 80%, 80, 75 or 80% of their electricity is nuclear, but interestingly, I mean, between 1975 and 2000, I mean, they built 56 reactors, all standardized, like the South Koreans, and they built them super fast, and they totally decarbonized their whole electric grid in just like 15 or 20 years. Really an incredible feat. And now they have the lowest carbon electricity of any European country. They also sell electricity to other countries in Europe. That's right. And Germany is now buying electricity. Yeah, <laughs> Germany shuts down. Well, since she brings up Germany, I'm, I'm curious. I, I think that Germany was going to eliminate nuclear power from their country, and with the advent of the Ukraine invasion, have they changed their mind? Or no, they, 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 they changed their mind briefly. They were like they had. They, there were three left um, when the Ukraine war started, and they were also to shut down December last last December, um, and they said, uh, let's. Let's wait till April. Uh, and so they actually announced a delay in those shutdowns uh, just to get them through the winter because they were they didn't have enough energy otherwise. But they still are proceeding with the shutdowns. People try. We all all the activists are out there screaming. But the the anti nuclear sentiment in Germany is huge and unstoppable. And so they're all going to be shut down. It's too bad. Yeah, it's sad. Anyway, um, well, um. So one one thing that's kind of saved us, even though we stopped building plants and costs skyrocketed, we did get extremely good at running nuclear power plants. So this is the capacity, this is the percentage of time that the plant is running at full power. So back in the 70s and 80s, it was like 60% or less because they were in outages, doing repairs, whatever. Um, but then as time went on, we learned and we got better. And, and we now we're at we're hitting 92% capacity all the time. So without even building any nuclear power plants, our overall nuclear capacity went up a lot because of this capacity factor. And that's fleet experience. That's when you first build a new type of reactor, you don't know how to operate it. You don't know what's going to happen. All this stuff breaks, and it always breaks. And it takes you decades to get to the point where you actually can operate that thing well. And so that's what happened with the current fleet, if we build new types of reactors, you can guarantee that this kind of thing is going to happen again. It'll start off not doing well, and after you learn, maybe they'll start doing well. Hard to say. Uh, you guys going to kick me out? <laughs> You're at 45 minutes. We're at 45? Okay. Well, let me fly through a couple other fun ones. Um, one fun fact that I think isn't well known is that nuclear power plants can load follow extremely well. They're perhaps the best thing at load following. Uh, they can change power at up to 5% full power per minute. So that's like a gigawatt. 5% of a gigawatt per minute is what those things can do. I mean, think of a combat nuclear submarine. Like, you better believe that thing can ramp up and down like crazy. And these commercial plants are, are the same. They choose not, they almost never load follow because it's just cheaper to run at full power all the time because that's that's like maximizing the, the hose of dollar bills that comes into your, because you're getting paid, you know, dollar bill, dollars per megawatt hour. So they generally don't load follow, but in a world where you're getting more and more wind and hydro and you have more and more, you want more badly to load follow with a low carbon energy source, nuclear is basically the only thing that can load follow on demand without emitting any carbon. Uh, Except for batteries. Uh, batteries are not an energy source. Oh, batteries no, that's require... true. They, they, can, they can plan the energy source. Maybe you're right. Yeah, but to do that, you have to build more capacity to charge them. And yeah. so the, the economics and the, the material intensity of building batteries at scale is basically, it's, it gets, it's, it challenges the concept of green energy. Well, that's why you use old used batteries from cars. <laughs> Like the, one they did at Earth the, the number of skyscrapers full of batteries that you need yeah. to run the United States through one night is in the ten thousands. Yeah, no, it worked at Perth. That's, That's, right. That's a lot of lead and a lot of acid. Don't yeah. Think. So it's anyway the material impact, land impact, overall ecological impact of running a nuclear plant in load follow mode is much less than a system that's like all wind and solar plus batteries because that system just gets to these obscene scales. Um, to deal with the water. You know, here we have, well, we, we're, we're like to have hydro in, in Seattle, but, you know, we have a two-week lull in wind every year in January. No wind at all in Bonneville Power Administration for two, for like 10 full days. And of course, the sun sets at like, what, 4.30. So, um, 
that kind of the, the system you'd have to build to power that with wind and solar batteries is truly ridiculous. Like it's not an option. Um, so anyway, but and most people say like nuclear plants can't load follow, and so that's the reason I like to emphasize this because they can, if you if you want them to, you'd have to you'd have to set up some kind of low carbon capacity market that would make them interested in being converted. But it looks like this one was able to go from about six fifty up to fourteen hundred. Yep. The black one, the square. Yeah, and they can do this. And they do this daily in France. And they, these are German ones that are shut down now, but they did this every single day to just follow the daily load. But that's basically a factor of two. That's the point I'm <coughs> making. It's a factor of two. True. Yeah, they they don't, they're necessarily going to go down to zero, but they can do. They can bring in an extra five hundred megawatts. You know, to help you ramp up when the sun sets. Like you could do some interesting. Okay. Um, oh, go ahead. Why can't you just uh, pump water uphill and store that water that energy that way? Oh, you can, and that's what I mean. Yeah, <laughs> you need a, you need a huge so to put the water. Water is very low density, and so the, the size of the reservoir and the impact on the ecosystem and the land area that it takes to do that at scale is astronomical. So you can't do it basically anywhere. And there isn't. Like here we have the Cascades, that's, and we have the Snake River. There's uh, Gordon, the, the Gordon Butte, and there's a Vantage Washington yeah. project, but only one of those is funded, and several of them are being protested. So, yeah, I mean you can do it, but and it's just not. not that it's big. way this again is much smaller, much less of an impact, probably a lot easier. So are they able to run Columbia Generating like this? Yeah, they could, but they don't. Because they would, they've got a contract with Bonneville that says we pay you for whatever you do? Yeah, and, and they get more money if they're at full Anybody power. need something else over here? Is everything okay? Thank you. Okay. I just want to make sure. Okay. Yeah, I mean, if you said, hey, we'll give you, we'll pay you for the capacity to turn up in power at night, and then and you made it worth their while, they would be able to do it. If that was cheaper than building a bunch of batteries and gravity storage things that you could do. No, that, but if they were trying to price. respond to the marketplace, they might do something like that. As it is, they've got a contract to put or pay. Yeah, that's true. They've got a put or pay contract. That's true. That is true. I think once Centralia coal mine shuts down, the last one, so we just we're, we're going to want all that energy. It's mm -hmm. shut down away. No, the I'm first saying, one was. There's a second it, one, 25. It, it is true, isn't it, that Columbia could do this if that was the market they were trying to meet? Yes. They are technically and legally capable of doing this. Yeah. yeah. All right. And, uh, no, I didn't get through all 95 on my slides, and that's probably for the best. I do want to go through just a few fun other uses of nuclear besides electricity. So we already mentioned a few of these submarines, aircraft carriers, commercial shipping, super interesting. The NS Savannah was a nuclear-powered shipping thing. If you want to decarbonize ocean shipping, that's a pretty interesting way to go. <coughs> Nuclear-powered spacecraft has, has been done, so interesting. Um, district heat. There are nuclear plants that take that waste heat and pump it to all the buildings nearby and provide building heating, now decarbonizing that part that's almost all gas. So you can like, you could get heating uh, from your nuclear plant. And you can pump this 100 kilometers away from the plant. It's like incredible. So this is a really interesting way of potentially getting where, more where that, value. That, this one's in Switzerland, but there's a bunch in China also. <coughs> China's building a lot more of these because they have major problems with um, cold evening right. and winter causing air pollution, and so they're just building nuclear reactors that are just making heat. Okay, yeah, that one's in Shandong. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, radionuclides for cancer treatments, I think you've probably heard of that, that's another thing nuclear reactors can do. Remote power, this uh, Mars Curiosity rover is powered by plutonium 238 battery that uh, was made in a nuclear reactor. Here's a truck-mounted mobile nuclear reactor called ML1 that ran back in the 60s. Uh, you can desalinate water at, in massive amounts with nuclear reactors. Back in the 60s, we had plans to make these big agro-industrial uh, complexes making, so you have two big reactors, and that would, um, doo -doo, that would, Six million people, how much, how much water? One billion gallons of fresh water desalinated per day from a system like that. So you got water problems, you got water solutions. You give me concentrated cheap energy and uh, you can do pretty much anything with it. And then of course you can also, <laughs> did you know that from 1993 to 2013, 
10% of our electricity in this country came from dismantled Soviet nuclear warheads. <laughs> it's a crazy story. We bought them, they downlighted their HEU. I mean, these warheads were pointed at our cities. They literally then powered 10% of our electricity for 20 years. It's a huge That's program. Cool. So it's a real fun way to get rid of, it's, it's sort of like Mount Doom. The only way to, to truly destroy a nuclear reactor is to throw it back into the, or sorry, a nuclear weapon is to throw it back into the, into the core. Fires from the cicada. Yeah, exactly. So anyway, all right, I better stop there. Um, yeah, great talk. I'll let you do it. Okay, I'll do it. Yeah, go ahead. Well, this is sort of a two-sided thing, and it, it might annoy you. <laughs> I, have to, I have to warn you. I, I, I can't be annoyed. Okay. <laughs> well, well, that's easy. All right. H have you ever given a similar presentation to an anti-nuclear group? Have you had the temerity to do that, or have they, had, have they invited you? I, I don't I'd say they haven't invited me. I've given talks along these lines in Seattle a number of times, but most people have been pretty, they're like, oh, okay, that's interesting, like, well, and then they have questions, you know, let's hear about the waste, let's hear about cost, things like that, but um, in general, people have been pretty, like, open to it. I, can't, I haven't given it to, like, an all-out nuclear, anti-nuclear organization. Well, and I've only had a few people like come up and be like, who's they? We just say this lies. Um, that just happened like once. Well, the <laughs> second part of my question is, you know, being a skeptics group, I think most of the people in this audience basically agree with the thrust of having nuclear power. Sure. I mean, when I was 17, I was an anti-nuclear activist. Yeah. I grew up, okay. But having said that, can you recommend an organization who might have a speaker who, even if he or she completely disagrees with you, might give a presentation that wouldn't offend us by being crazy. Okay, in other words, for, for example, I don't want to hear from a flat earther because they're nuts. Uh, but but can you can you tell us somebody who who might give a contrarian view to what you're saying that we could invite and analyze? Yeah, I mean we have our I'm trying to think of someone like in town. Like we definitely have our El Guapos like on Twitter or whatever. But like Carl, do you have anyone in mind in town? Because uh, Carl's in the he knows these groups. Yeah, if if you if you got someone from Thank you. Yeah, the right. positions for social responsibility, yes. you might not be completely offended, but you would probably stop them halfway through with questions. Yeah. Yeah. I, no, that's fine. no, no, yeah. according to yeah. Dr. Helen Caldicott, oh, no. we're all dead. No, no, Caldicott is pretty she's much totally the worst. Crazy. Beyond nuclear is the worst of the worst. <laughs> yeah, but she's, she's one PSR. of the founders. Yeah. She was yeah, one of the founders of PSR. PSR is a very reasonable guy. Yeah. And is that, they have a local group? Yeah, they're, they're, they're very local. They're, 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 he's he's actually top. located down in Oregon. They, they follow us around sometimes. But, but <laughs> his focus, <laughs> his focus is almost entirely on waste. Yeah. He yeah. really doesn't question anything about the, uh, the nuclear, except that he feels it's too heavily subsidized, and he doesn't compare that to how heavily it's subsidized on the wind. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but, but his, his concern is with the with the put or pay contract from Bonneville. He's very workbook about that. And he really feels the problem is waste. And his, his attack is simple. If you're in a hole, you stop digging. <laughs> Yeah, but again, with that, seven million people dying per year plus plus climate change, or a small amount of stuff in a perfectly safe container. I mean, it's a, that, it's a simple choice. We that we could, and they, we they could they recycle also, and they, reuse better. Yes, people. Well, that was the question I want to raise: is that I understand that Terra Power has walked away from traveling away. That's what everybody tells me. That that no. the idea of burning up the waste in a reactor seems to have turned out not to be a workable idea. Could you please comment on that? Yeah, I mean, yeah, they, just based on public information, they, they, most, they, they never, the concept that they were burning nuclear waste in the first place wasn't actually accurate. Like, that was said all over the place, but it never, they never were actually burning nuclear waste. What they were burning was depleted uranium or natural uranium. 
that's the concept of the traveling wave reactor. So that stuff, non-radioactive stuff, tailings from the enrichment plant or whatever, that stuff, putting it into the reactor and then letting that, building up plutonium and burning it in a traveling wave without ever separating it, that concept is still a part of their published roadmap. It's the long-term plan, but it turns out that to get to the materials and fuels you need to be able to achieve that require more development. And so right now they're doing a reactor that is still that makes sense in the current context and is a stepping stone towards that reactor and is still moving in that direction. It gets better and better as you move towards that reactor. So they haven't stepped away from it. They've just gotten on, a, on a, the first step towards it. Okay, so be more clear. So what they were talking about using in the traveling wave reactor. Yes, okay. and, there were, and it was misreported all over the place. And I tried to like go on Wikipedia and correct, but it was, it was always just burning non-radioactive, natural uranium, you know, the yellow cake picture or the or depleted uranium that comes out of the enrichment. It was never planned. The whole point was to get away from reprocessing because reprocessing the spent fuel is expensive and it has caused lots of proliferation concerns in the past. And so the whole point was like, forget about reprocessing. Reprocessing is dumb. We're just going to get all the benefits of a breeder reactor by going to a super deep burn fuel and just burn depleted uranium. When I talk with Mark about the sodium cooled bass reactor, I got the impression that a later iteration of the fuel cycle might be able to to take you know fissionable actinides. Is that still true? Oh it, yeah, you could if you if you decided if you decided oh let's reprocess after all and right. someone said we want you to reprocess you could absolutely do it. That type a fast neutron reactor can okay. eat through waste like nothing. Yeah. You had to reprocess it and we've. Like the, the Bill Gates and the gang, their whole point was like, we don't want to reprocess. Reprocessing right. is what caused all these crazy costs and proliferation concerns in the past. So let's do breeders without reprocessing. Yeah. So, the, okay. so, so the, hope, the hope that I'm getting is that that sodium cooled, which is the, the, the new natrium branded reactor, it's like many years down the line, maybe is the answer. Yeah, if somebody shows up with a reprocessing plant and starts making fabricating hot or fabricated reprocessed fuel, we'll take it and we'll put it in that reactor and it'll burn great. <laughs> yeah. yeah, go ahead. So a different topic. Can you comment on um, hydrogen fuel production, which is very energy intensive, I understand, and using nuclear energy for that? Is that something you see happening? Yeah. This a lot of talk about that. There's all these different colors of hydrogen depending on how good it is, like where it comes from. Almost all hydrogen comes from natural gas at the moment. Um, people are talking about using clean energy to make hydrogen. And if you do that, then it's a longer, it's like a battery. You can store, if you have wind and solar or nuclear, you can store that energy in a transportable hydrogen liquid fuel. Of course, it's cryogenic and super high pressure and all sorts of crazy stuff and explosive. But, um, but yeah, you could you can definitely use nuclear reactors to make hydrogen. Just like, you, and in fact, it's probably better and easier to use nuclear reactors than it would be to just use um, something purely electric, like wind or solar. The reason being uh, to do like electrolysis, where you split a, a water, water molecule, mold, yeah. it works better at high temperatures. So if you can preheat that all up with the nuclear steam and then apply the electricity, then it's incredibly more efficient than just applying electricity to low temperature water. So the, the option to make hydrogen with nuclear is pretty strong. It works better with higher temperature reactors than what we normally have. So some of these advanced reactors that go to higher temperature are more efficient at making it. So the desalinization plants were essentially operating with water at very high temperatures? Yeah, most of so the ones... Would, those, would, the, would the desalinization plants be a first step toward they, using a nuclear reactor for, for hydrogen. hydrogen? Yeah, I mean, you could definitely, you could make desalinated water and hydrogen at the same plant and just repeat. I mean, you could make it this, like, real depot of interesting energy stuff. Uh, these days, like, a lot of the nuclear plants that have done desalination use the, like, thermal methods, <coughs> um, multi-stage flash and so on. But these days, reverse osmosis, which is, like, purely electric, has become so much cheaper that it's, it's almost better to just take the electricity without the heat and just run it on the I have a problem. You mentioned that vacant reaction is a chain, re uh, is a chain reaction. Yeah. So once it uh, once it's fully developed, and uh, but it lost control. So is there any way to stop the reaction? 
Yeah. Just like Chernobyl or yeah. the Chernobyl in Japan. Yeah. So that's, you can the way you design the reactor, you can make it so that it's it, once it starts going more, it's either going to be positive feedback and cause more and more chain reactions. That's what happened at Chernobyl. But a tradition like a real reactor, any like reasonable, every other reactor besides like Chernobyl has it so that when that coolant starts heating up, the coolant boils away, but the coolant. And so the coolant no longer slows the neutrons down, and so but slow neutrons cause fission much better. So once the coolant's gone, the chain reaction stops. And so it's a it's a stabilizing feedback as opposed to a positive feedback. And so like that kind of runaway chain reaction can in a modern non Chernobyl design. So you answered my first question. My second question is that uh, compared to fusion reaction, fusion reaction need a continuous, uh, continuous energy input. So once the uh, energy input stopped, the fusion reaction will be stopped. So from this perspective, will fusion be much safer and better compared with fission? That, that is one of the, I mean, you're, yeah, that's one of the like postulated advantages of fusion is that it would be like, there would, if you, if you turn it off, it just turns off. It doesn't go to 7% power and need backup cooling and so on. And so there is, the it may be safer if you could get it to work. The problem is, is no one's been able to get it to work yet. But yeah, that's the part of the reason that billionaires are throwing money into fusion is because people are kind of like, well, isn't fission like not good enough? What if we could do fusion? It has like a few advantages. It makes less waste and you can turn it off by turning it off the power source. Those are advantages. But the disadvantage is that it doesn't work. <laughs> a little detail. After that, so the fusion reaction can create, can generate positive uh, energy now. Uh, well, not quite. Uh, National ignition facility. Yeah. Yeah. yeah they, they, they put. They, it depends where you put the control volume. If you put the control volume on the little fuel pellet, they got more energy out of a little thing this big. It's about they put. one percent efficient, right? Now. Right. Yeah. For every hundred megawatts, you get one megawatt out. So it's thermal it, positive. It yeah, may, thermal it, positive. and someone may. They may fuse it in a pellet with lasers, and yeah. that part works. And and there's and certainly someone may make uh, net positive an, an actual power plant from fusion. There's a real big question in my mind. It's like even if you get a power plant, it, it may be a thousand times more expensive than natural gas. And so like even if you can get power out, you still have this economic challenge. And like that's to be determined. There's a bunch of companies out there who say, "Oh yeah, two, three years, we're gonna have it all. It's gonna be done." I don't believe any of them. I heard that there is a startup in Seattle working on yeah. fusion. There's like three of them. <laughs> yeah, and they're yeah. making mega bucks. They have huge investments. They're always <laughs> one year away from the breakthrough. Right. Right. Uh, the past that's twenty the years. And, and again, I started off in fusion. Like I, w I became interested in nuclear through fusion. It is a fascinating technology. There's lots of interesting advances going on. There are through. You know, some new technologies are coming to light that may make it much easier. So, I mean, it's worth looking into. I'm glad people are looking into it, but I, it's not something that we should rely on. Where we have fission plants that are out there, we've already decarbonized huge areas. Like that, we should, right now, we should be building fission plants like crazy to get rid of fossil. We should be building wind and solar like crazy, hydro like crazy, fission like crazy. And we should have a bunch of people working on fusion just in case. That's kind of how I see it. In the back. I was going to say that I used to ride a hydrogen-fueled bus back when I used to live in Perth, Western Australia. We had two of them, and they were going on an ongoing trial. Uh, I last left, I, I left uh, t 10 years ago, so I don't know if they're still in trial, but um, I just thought that was cool. Yeah, there, there was a big wave of hype around hydrogen around 2004 and five and six. And like I watched a guy who was a dean of an engineering school. He said, "Look at this car." And he went in front of this huge group of people. This car just has hydrogen fuel cells. And he put it on the ground and it ran. And he's like, "It's just making water vapor." And everyone like gasped. And then he like picked it back up and he handed it to somebody who plugged it into the wall. Oh, <laughs> no. recharge it. Oh, and I like ran. I was like, "Are you gonna tell him that you?" He like kind of snuck. Anyway, yeah, it was like a funny. total pullover. It's like, oh, it's magic. But anyway, it's just another type of battery. All right, go ahead. Okay. The the big thing that the guys who are going to argue against you always bring up is cost, mm -hmm. the economics. You said you had some slides in economics. Yeah. You want to go through those? Well, you I, want I, me to ask my question first? 
<laughs> we, we might get revolted against. You can ask your question. All right, I'll here's the point. Is what people are saying is that going to the modular factory build will, in fact, result in significantly lower overall cost from the day you say, let's build it, to the day you say, the power is coming down the wire. Yeah. Uh, okay. Is that, in fact, true? Do we have any real data that shows that the factory-built modules will, in fact, be cheaper than these god-awful things at Savannah and whatnot where the, where the price just runs away forever because they can? Yeah. Well, let um, me wrap my question up in yours. What, what I was okay. going to say is, how's Terra Power doing, <laughs> basically? You know, where are they at right now, which you could maybe relate uh, to me, his question. Okay, let me, let me start with that with your question, which, so, yeah, a lot of people in the nuclear industry are saying, oh, let's go small, small's gonna be better. There is currently no real hard data that says that's true. There's no examples of that being true. There's a lot of examples of that being false. We built dozens of small reactors back in the 60s, little tiny ones. For submarines. Submarines and also power plants, Elf River, uh, Hallam. We built a bunch of 60 megawatt electric reactors, very small, tried to serialize them. They did, they were, they were, uh, People looked at them and were like, oh, if only that thing were 10 times bigger, it would be economical. <laughs> and so they got bigger. Um, but we're sort of backed into a corner because like financing a big reactor in the West right now is like impractical and will bankrupt large utilities or vendors and so on. And so starting small with like new types of designs kind of makes sense just to be small, you know, because you don't know at first, you might as well start small. And if indeed mass production ends up being better than economies of scale, great, we'll do mass production production but like there's no real reason to think that's gonna happen like my the, the thing that we've seen that works is mass like uh standardization single, single design large, yeah single design large reactors and build like south korea is doing like france did like china is doing with Kualong one those are the models that are pber in russia all work great and like if you want to decarbonate rapidly right now you go get the yeah. South Koreans to come over here and you have them build a couple of APR 1400s and you watch them and you learn how to do it and then you build them. Which is kind of, there's a symmetry to it because we taught the South Koreans nuclear technology back in the 70s. They bought our design, com the combustion engineering systems 80 plus and they sort of held the data, they perfected it and now they could give it back and it would be like, it's like the dark ages. So are those pressurized boiling water? Yeah, they're, yeah, they're pressurized water reactors. They're big Gen 3, kind of regular, but is, they have, they've learned all the history on that curve where they're all operating really well. Is the savings just that they don't have to go through permitting every time? Yeah, that's part of it, but also all the, the supply chain, all the components are fully designed. You can go out and buy them. They have spec sheets. You can, there's vendors for them. Whereas if you have some new tiny wreck that no one's ever built before, you have to find some company like, hey, I need a control rod drive. You need to design it, build one. You may never sell another one. Like the vendors are like, why would I do that? Oh, I'm going to charge you 20x. You know, so the cost just those like first of a kind costs are really high. So, so these Korean and whatnot designs are how many megawatts? They're like over a thousand. A thousand megawatts. Fourteen hundred. Fourteen hundred 1400 megawatts. Yep. And they basically are a package of designs. And if you say you want one in Renton, Washington. They can literally deliver it. Yeah. Well, they'll build, they'll, they'll send some of they did in the UAE. The United Arab Emirates said, We want these reactors. 20,000 Korean construction workers came over. They stood up a whole nuclear regulatory, I mean, the, the, the Emiratis stood up a whole nuclear regulatory regime. And then the South Koreans taught them how to build it and built most of it. And then they taught them, like, it was, there was a lot of like knowledge transfer as they built it. Like so we, how long did it take to get one of the first one or the, some of them built, uh, and how did it cost compared to say Savannah? Those ones, yeah, super cheap. I, I I don't have the exact numbers off my top of my head, but like they built they built one, two, three, four in a row. The first one I think took like six years to get going, and then like it's been they had unit two on the second year, unit three just turned on a month ago, and they'll have unit four on next year. So that, I mean they're just pounding them out. And they had Do you have the they had two well they had two scandals during that build. They had Fukushima Daiichi and they had the certificate scandal where, where they found a significant part of the South Korean supply chain had a fraud problem and they had to address it. And, that, and that's why, you know, like, they almost turned off a bunch of reactors because of it. Yeah, in South Korea. Yeah. Anyway, and the total price is like 
was really good, especially for a first of a kind and a new new pair. Could, could you compare the total price of the four to the same megawatts of wind in the Columbia Gorge, not counting the federal subsidies? Um, More that, expensive, less expensive? Well, <laughs> that's a hard comparison because if you just do capacity, I mean, like, what capacity. do you guys do? Capacity. I mean, there's, oh, just capacity, but wind only runs 45% of the time or 35% of the time, so it's not fair to just do capacity. But if you do oh, capacity, sorry. what does it do? Dog. <laughs> uh, I I don't have the numbers on the top of my head. With capa but you can't, do cap you can't do capacity. I mean, you have to do system costs. Like, because if you just build, okay, okay. Like, Life, you build lifetime. 50 gigawatts of wind, and okay. then you have a two-week wind outage, how much are you going to pay right, so, for so, all those so, people to so not die? A 20 year, a 20 year construction plus operation. Would wind still be cheaper? <clears throat> Sorry. Say if you did 20 years, construction plus 20 years of operation, would wind still be cheaper? 20 years of what? Of nuclear construction? Uh, no, no, construction of the plant. Plus 20 years of operation going to dry cask storage. Well, they, the nuclear plants run for 60 or 80 years. No, but let's just say for 20 years. Well, yeah, no. I mean, what, the, what, the, what, where does no, it no, for a 20 year what? nuclear, a per 20 year lifetime for nuclear would be a disaster because the, the capital cost, the loan you have to pay back on the capital cost for a big nuclear plant, you would never pay back in the. Even for one of these Korean plants. Right. I mean, 20 years would be cutting it. You could maybe break even in 20 years. You can usually pay the mortgage off. Like it's in 60 years when it gets that, and a lot of these plants are extending to 80 years now. But you really, I mean, to do cost comparisons, you have to do full system analysis right. where you have 100% reliable electricity, whatever systems that takes. That takes transmission, that takes batteries, that takes you know all sorts of back gas backup, pipelines, permitting versus the nuclear plant, which can do it all without any of that stuff. So, like, to do those comparisons, no one's doing those comparisons fairly right now. There's only, like, one paper where a guy came up with something called the levelized full system cost of electricity. Everybody talks about levelized cost of electricity, which is meaningless for actual system comparisons. Mm -hmm. And even all the energy experts agree. Like, yeah, you can use LCE for systems comparisons. It doesn't make sense. It's just for, like, the next generator you build. And, right, like, wind and solar have the huge advantage, like, are super cheap to build marginal capacity. When it comes to decarbonizing huge areas across years, it's better to have a mix of things that can run 24-7 with low carbon plus the wind and solar. So having a mix, maybe 50% nuclear, or maybe a third of each would be like a pretty good mix. And there's publications that show how that's dramatically cheaper if you do those types of mixtures as opposed to one or the other. Yeah, yeah so we gotta stop. I might just argue also that we as taxpayers have put huge, and we are still putting huge amounts into the fossil fuel industry, if we just turn that around and put it into the nuclear industry, we'd be, we'd be decarbonized in 10, 20 years. Yeah. Good luck with those politics. Yeah, <laughs> politics. Well, anyway, yeah, so thanks everyone. I know I went way over, but thanks so for much. I wish we could talk about discount factor. That's a whole other yeah. discussion. <laughs> discount rate. <laughs> Go up a bit. Thank you. Down. Thanks again, everybody. Okay. <laughs> 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 you are yeah, you are is included in the bill.